welcome everyone uh, this morning um, to our uh, um, journal club. And uh, we have taken a slight um, a detour away from what the topics have been in the uh, over the past few months, which have been focused on um, thyroid nodule workup as well, and many topics in thyroid cancer. Um, and it's uh, truly a pleasure to um, have our presenter and discussant here this morning. Just a few quick things before we do get started. One is that um, we will be um, uh, trying to leave some time at the end for questions and encourage you to tap on the um, icon on the right of your screen for questions and just type those in as we go. And I'm going to do my best uh, to get to those as we move along. Um, towards the end. There will be a hard stop at nine o'clock so that everyone can get to um, the rest of their day. And um, as always, we welcome comments and questions. If uh, folks um, do want to um, send in anything, we're, we constantly welcome your feedback as we try to, um, uh, to tailor the program to, uh, to meet the needs of everybody who has been attending over the last few months here. Um, so it's really a, a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Juan Brito, who is the Associate Professor of Medicine in the, the Division of Endocrinology at the Mayo Clinic. He is co-director of Late Stage Translational Research Program at Mayo Center for Clinical and Translational Science. He's also the Medical Director of the Mayo Clinic Shared Decision-Making National Resource Center. Um, in addition, we have the honor of um, Dr. Rene Rodriguez Gutierrez, uh, who is clinical, a clinical endocrinologist, methodologist, and healthcare researcher um, at the University uh, Universidad Autónoma de Neuro, de Neuro uh, Leon. I apologize for my uh, pronunciation here. Um, in Mexico, where he is also a professor of medicine in the Division of Endocrinology. In addition, he is uh, to his research initiatives. He is the current president of the Medical Association. Mexican Association of Diabetes in um, Nuevo León. So um, welcome to both of you. Uh, very much looking forward to your presentation and commentary. Um, and as we've done in the past, we've uh, started off with a poll and an attempt to see how much people's um, ideas regarding this particular topic are influenced um, over the course of the hour. And so we'll come back to the same poll at the end of um, uh, Dr. Rodriguez uh, Gutierrez presentation and see if uh, folks have changed their impressions here. Um, so Juan, welcome and uh, thank you again for carving out some time for us. Thank you, Mark, and thank you everybody for inviting me. I'm really, really happy to be here and present um, some of the research that a group have conducted in regards to the comparative effectiveness of uh, treatment choices for patients with Graves' disease. I have no conflict of interest, and uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, this is the case. Um, it's a 30-year-old female, complains of restlessness, unintentional weight loss, and growth in her neck. On physical examination, her blood pressure is 112 over 72, the pulse is 102. Findings on physical exam are relevant for a diffusely enlarged goiter, uh, sorry, a non-tender goiter with audible brood, no ocular symptoms or signs of orbitopathy. In the past few weeks, uh, the patient has been complaining of sporadic episodes of muscle weakness precipitated by moderate physical activity. The TSH is suppressed, 3T4 is very elevated, 7, and elevated uh, TRAB levels, which is 30, which is the thyroid receptor antibodies. Based on the above mentioned findings, you suspect uh, the patient has grave disease. Which of the following would you be your first choice for long-term treatment of the patient's hyperthyroidism? You have four options there, and I think the pool is going to be launched now.
Okay, should I continue or should I wait a little bit longer? Okay, I guess I will continue. So then, since I was a, a fellow at Mayo, I was always fascinated by the decision-making process of patients with grave disease, because despite having very good tre treatment alternatives, um, this, there was a significant struggle on how to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And that is in part because each treatment option had a specific set of attributes um, that make no treatment the best for everybody. So patients might choose for uh, methimazole because they were concerned about side effects of radioactive iodine, or patients were right, thinking about pregnancy, or there were many comorbidities or issues of course, or access to the surgeon if they were thinking about surgery. So it, it was a really difficult decision. Um, and what we know from patient-centered decision process is that any decision in medicine has to consider the evidence as part of the of the, what the patient's context uh, is and the values. So this seems one of those situations in which uh, patient-centered decision-making should be the default. And this has been something that the guidelines actually strongly suggest. This is American um, Thyroid Association guidance for treatment of hyperthyroid. This was released in 2011. And they recognize that three treatments for uh, um, uh, grave disease, the radioactive iodine, the antithyroid drugs, and surgery. And they, they display the attributes of these options, but at the end of it, they actually strongly recommend that patients and clinicians should discuss the attributes of these treatment options, logistics, benefits, potential side effects, and costs to make a decision that makes sense to the patient. So in other words, the decision should be based mostly in shared decision-making process. But what was happening is that the treatment was dictated of where you live. If you were to uh, be someone in Europe or being diagnosed in Europe, you will likely to be treated with methimazole as, uh, as opposed to radioactive iodine or surgery. And if you were to be treated in the United States, you were more likely to be treated with radioactive iodine. So something didn't fit because if this is clearly something that was based on the conversation between patients and clinicians, it will be a different distribution of options, not clearly radioactive iodine, not clearly antithyroid drugs. And this was uh, proven in this paper that we published in 2016. We went back to the records at Mayo Clinic from 2002 to 2008, and we captured how patients get treated in our institution. This is the therapy selection percentage, and this is the treatment choice over time. As you can see here, um, the light gray here is the number of patients that were treated with grave disease. Uh, using radioactive iodine. And 80, 90% of the times, patients and our institutions, and our institution were treated with radioactive iodine. And when I was training as a fellow, um, it was clear from the message that we got is that Mayo Clinic is a radioactive iodine institution because it was effective and the patients were uh, relatively easier to follow. So that, again, did not strike me as a shared decision-making approach with the patient. So we decided um, to do something about it and to develop a series of, of experiments and tools to support these conversations with patients in a way that is not only dictated by the culture of the institution, but rather what happens with the patients and encounters. So one of the first things that we did is, what, what is the evidence about the effectiveness of each uh, therapy? We knew of few cohorts that get cited very often um, about the effectiveness, but there was no such a, a, a process in which the, the evidence was summarized. So we decided to do a systematic review of all the comparative cohorts, meaning all the studies that compared the three alternatives and actually estimate what is the effectiveness of each therapy. So we conduct a systematic review of available databases, and we ended up with only eight studies seven in English, one in Spanish, only one clinical, a randomized clinical trial, the rest were retrospective or, or prospective cohorts. Um, these studies, what pretty much showed is that um, if you compared surgery with radioactive iodine, this is a forest plot of the old studies. And when, the, when we see this um, uh, here crossing the line of one means that there's no difference between the alternatives. 
as you can see here, radioactive iron and surgery were equally, equally effective. But clearly, radioactive iodine and clearly surgery were more effective than antithyroid drugs in reaching um, in, in reaching a cure, or at least what we call a remission of, anti or, uh, of grave disease. And of course, with these estimates, we can actually calculate a percentage uh, in terms of people getting uh, better at 12 months, at, 20, at 18 months, and with that, we move to the next step, which is, okay, we have the evidence uh, about the effectiveness that this is the best available evidence, um, and we collected additional evidence about cost, adverse effects, um, the speed of recovery, like long therapy replacement, and other factors that we knew uh, were important at the decision-making process. And what we did next is that we took that and we turned it into a, a tool. Uh, and counter tool. Uh, it was a paper based in, in which uh, we try different prototypes with patients and clinicians to see how this information actually supports these conversations that we were hoping uh, they will happen. And we're trying different formats, we're trying different models, and this one, this one was the one that after 20, 21 uh, prototypes was the more effective. And this is the, the just a few pages of that decision of the, this decision in which we presented the options of treatment. We presented what they mean. We presented also how people get better at three months, 18 months, and in pictograms just to show what they actually could be. Uh, it could be one of the ones that clearly get better at three months with this therapy, or the ones that will not get better uh, with this uh, treatment choice. And as you can see here at that time which was 2015, uh, we were uh, here suggesting that if you fail uh, antithyroid drugs, you actually should continue with radioactive iodine and surgery. So that is important because we were wrong. Uh, and of course, um, we were trying to fix that, but at that time we considered that if you fail, you have to switch. And if you fail, if you, if you, if you, don't, if you fail at the end of 18 months, again, you can switch. We also, in this decision aid, we let the clinicians help patients understand what type of replacement means. So when you are in antithyroid drugs, there is no need for levothyroxine. But if you are taking radioactive iron and surgery, it is a permanent uh, solution for which you have to actually have to replace the thyroid. And we discuss what this means in terms of fluctuations, side effects, the timing, daily routine and cost. We also talk about complications uh, for each of the alternatives a little bit of the what it means in terms of the future. So aspects that we thought that were important, and we tested this tool in, um, with a pre and post uh, design in which we video record encounters without the use of the tool uh, for eight, eight to nine months of the clinicians just doing the regular thing. And then we video record the same clinicians using the tool with, of course, a different set of patients. And this is the, the results in which we have different aspects of the conversations about side effects, about issues of fertility, surgery and permanent scars, side, or side effects of um, or the issues with radioactive iodine and precautions after therapy, and cause of treatment, for instance, as you can see here in, in blue, is the frequency in which these topics were mentioned when you don't have the tool. And in pink, in pink is when they actually had the tool how often they talk about these issues. And as you can see across all the topics, when the tool was available, these attributes of the treatment choices were more frequently as, um, mentioned between clinicians and patients. So clearly the tool was having a significant impact of that. But what it was more interesting for us is that although we were doing the experiment in the same institution that in which we collected data a decade ago in which radioactive iodine was the most important treatment, this study actually shows us that patients were, uh, patients and clinicians were doing a very difficult, were making a very difficult, uh, different decision. This is the frequency of patients who choose antithyroid drugs with usual care or with a tool, what we call GD choice. So as you can see here, it was not a striking difference of patients choosing radioactive iron versus uh, entire drugs. Actually, 50-50 to some extent. It was not the 80-90% of patients actually choosing only radioactive iron. So something changed in the culture of my institution in the way that patients get treated. And we also see some effect of the use of the decision aid, but it was not statistically significant. 
So that led us to, to do a study to understand, okay, if this is happening in Mayo Clinic, and there were already some um, suggestions that it's not only about Mayo, that was actually something changed in the United States. We did a, um, we did a population-based study in which we characterized um, what happened in terms of treatment choices between 2005 and 2014 in the United States. Um, as you can see here, we were able to mark the trends of treatment with antiviral drugs, radioactive iodine, and surgery. And the, fr the frequency of people getting treated with surgery really not changed. It's still 8 to 10 percent. Um, but people getting treated with radioactive iodine actually decreased significantly over time uh, compared to people treated with antiviral drugs. So this was the first um, uh, significant signal that whatever we were presenting to the patients, you know, in terms of uh, radioactive iodine as what people choose, it was changing. And that demanded um, a new way to see the evidence, not only from a single center um, experience, which is biased to some extent, but we wanted to analyze, uh, we wanted to explore what is the experience of treatment um, in the whole population of the United States, or at least a representative sample of people at the United States. So this is the paper uh, in which we, we base the discussion today, uh, is the patterns of use, efficacy, and safety of treatment options for patients with liver disease in a national population-based study. So what we did in this study is we use this data set, and it's the Optum Labs data set. And it's a very comprehensive, very large data set that represents about 130 million people in um, the United States. And so this is represented as, imagine that this is the population of the United States. This is not updated. This is the data that I have from the last, I think, two or three years from this um, uh, data set, but this is what it was conveyed at that time. So from this population, this is uh, what we the data set is using, mostly 130 million. Not all, of those, all of those have EMR information, um, so maybe the EMR is in about 40% of those patients, so this is mostly about claims. And it's very important to understand the a limitation of this data set is that it's in, including mostly privately insured patients and Medicare Advantage. So it's not including patients that have no insurance, so which is a, it's a limitation when we think about the representative of this, of this uh, data set. Um, the other, uh, which might be a strength, a weakness, is this distribution of how patients get represented in this data set. So as you can see here, there are areas in the United States that get very well represented in this data set, uh, marked in blue and dark blue, and areas that are not that well represented in, in this data set. So although it's a very good population-based uh, data set, there are some weaknesses and, of course, some strengths. And um, we decided to collect the data now from 2005 to 2013 of every patient who was recently diagnosed from grave disease, and we wanted to capture the treatment that they took or was decided. To do that, we had to request different things from this cohort. And a tricky thing about assembling a cohort in these population-based studies is that you have to be very particular in the way that you create this cohort. You have to, be, you have to make very, uh, several decisions uh, in regards to what is the, the best cohort, at the same time maintaining a good sample size and trying to not sacrifice some of the important variables that we want to collect. So we, we asked the cohort, we asked the data set to give us only those patients that have uh, available data uh, for 12 months before the treatment choice and even two years after. So we wanted to have three years of which patients continue to be seen on a regular basis, and that we know that there were people that we can capture uh, treatment uh, effectiveness and how the people responded to that. And this was the initial cohort. So we had 21,000 patients that were diagnosed with grave disease. Um, but when we applied this, the uh, criteria that I was telling you about, the cohort dropped significantly because we're exactly choosing the people that we have data for. And then we excluded patients that might have other types of hyperthyroidism, trying to get rid of the ones that might be miscoded, uh, patients that have maybe have history of thyroid cancer. So anybody who had radioactive iodine before that or thyroid cancer, we just considered adults. And we also did not consider those patients that have grave disease and were treated for less than 90 days 
because it's very unlikely that a true grave disease case only get treated for 90 days and nothing happens after that. Um, we thought that it was a decision we have to make, and most likely this is patients that might have some subacute thyroiditis that were treated with antithyroid drugs but mislabeled as grave disease. So at the end, we ended up with 4,600 patients in this cohort. Um, the tricky piece about it is that remember you don't have um, the, the you don't have the granularity of data in these population-based studies. Um, uh, compared to when you do chart review in an institution that you can actually see what's happening in the charts and, and what happened when patients failed, that granularity is, is difficult to get. So we have to make decisions about how to define failure. So in this cohort, when patients get treated with antithyroid drugs, we consider failure only in those patients that have been treated consistently for more than 60 days and they switch to radioactive iodine or they switch to surgery or if they have a break of 90 days. So this is to capture those patients that were doing well in radio, perhaps in antithyroid drugs, the clinician and patient decided to stop because patient was doing very well, but after 90 days, they actually went back to radioactive iron surgery or they went back to antithyroid drugs. Failure for radioactive iodine in surgery is relatively easy because if you fail surgery, radioactive iodine, you will likely to go to ATV or you do surgery. So it was a little bit easier to capture for surgery as well, although it's very unlikely people to fail surgery. But of course, there are always cases in which patients might need a little bit of antithyroid drugs or radioactive iodine. There are also some cases in which patients need to be treated with antithyroid drugs for a few weeks before radioactive iodine. And those were, uh, those were actually uh, included in the radioactive iodine cohort. But uh, we thought that it's important to characterize that uh, patients might have a different, um, or the efficacy of treatment might have changed in regards to the length of initial treatment for antithyroid drugs. So we did a sensitivity analysis for those patients who were treated between 90 days or those patients that were treated for at least a year with antithyroid drugs. These are the results of the study. Uh, so the cohort I was telling you about, 60% uh, were treated with antithyroid drugs, 33 before radioactive iodine, and only 6% with surgery. Uh, striking finding here is, you know, um, only 38% actually did not need additional therapy. 50% uh, did fail radioactive uh, antithyroid drugs, but the percentage of, of people here, about 12%, never stopped the methimazole. Or the, or the anti thyroid drugs. They never stop, they just continue without stopping. For the ones who failed, the vast majority actually went back to anti thyroid drugs. Few choice, uh, chose a surgery or they switched to radioactive iodine, and the majority continue with anti thyroid drugs. And if those patients still have uh, what we consider failure, they continue with anti thyroid drugs. So one important finding here is that there are a lot of people when they initiated antithyroid drugs that eventually will continue antithyroid drugs regardless of the failure. And radioactive iodine, again, the failure is much less, 7%. And when that fails, a few, per, few, uh, few people actually fail to that. But when that fails, it switched to antithyroid drugs. And again, they continue for more than two years. So about 26% of the whole cohort of patients were on chronic or ongoing antithyroid drugs. Something that we thought was not happening in the United States, well, we're thinking that that's typical or a, a little bit more the, um, the culture of, of treatment in, in other, in other uh, parts of the world, like Asia and China and India. There were, there were actually many reports of patients treated chronically with antithyroid drugs, but we are seeing that in the United States also that has been happening in the last two decades. When we did a sensitivity analysis in terms of what happens if we change the uh, what happens when we cut the, the cohorts by the length of antithyroid drugs for more than 60 days, more than 90 days, and more than three, uh, more than a year of therapy, the frequency of failure actually changed. So um, this is the failure rate. Uh, if you're just treated for more than 60 days, 50%, as I was telling you before, but if you get treated the longer time or the longer you're treated, the lower the frequency of failure. So for those patients who get antithyroid drugs for more than a year, the failure for, with antithyroid drugs is usually 25%. So very important finding as well. 
The frequency of adverse effects, um, this is in terms of treatment, the complications, the number of patients and percentage. I think we did not have any striking new finding. 12% uh, of people with metimazole had um, some side effects, the same with PTU. Um, radioactive iron about 6%. What is interesting here is the number of patients with uh, side effects from surgery, particularly hypoparathyroidism with 25% of the patients. Important to notice here is that we do not know if this was chronic over or temporary hypoparathyroidism. More, most likely this is a representation of temporary uh, hypoparathyroidism. So it's still a little bit high, but it's not the, the permanent one. So the summary of these findings is that um, we found a consistent result that ATD failed, uh, the, the failure rate for anti-tire drugs 50%. The majority of those patients who failed actually failed within the same year of initiation of therapy. But when just leave those patients with anti-tire drugs for more than one year, the failure, uh, the failure rate dropped significantly to 25%. Also that, um, the, when these patients failed, either anti tire drugs or the other therapies, the majority continued with anti tire drugs. So, anti tire drugs had been, um, or they became like a chronic kind of therapy for these patients, something that um, it was not really described before and which demands additional studies. And the adverse effects, as I was telling you before, um, anti drugs, although they are not uh, less effective than the other ones, have a side effect of 12%, much less with radioactive iodine, and 24% with surgery, but of course, this again might include a lot of patients with temporary hypoparathyroidism. So the limitations of, the, of our study is that we don't have the granularity of data, so we couldn't get um, the thyroid receptor antibody levels, for instance, and that gives us a limitation of predicting who might fail. And this is based on administrative claims, which is are susceptible for issues of coding and building practices. And then we consider switching as a failure, yet we know that switching in about 10% of people, sometimes it's not about failure, but about, about preferences. So they might have been doing relatively well in anti tire drugs, but at one point they got tired of taking pills and they decided to do radioactive iodine. For us, we consider failure because we don't have the granularity of data, but naturally we may be a representation of patients' preferences. And of course, this is a limitation in terms of the representative of the results or the application of results. This is mostly commercial health insurance population. So what is the future that we think uh, these results uh, lead to is that the tool that we had before has to be updated. Um, we clearly need to present the option of ongoing anti tyro therapy as um, as alternative for patients, uh, rather than this is a two-year thing. If you fail, that's it. And uh, we are working to actually develop a, a model to predict who fails, so patients can actually uh, enter information in the chart. Uh, we pull information from the chart. And similar to this tool about the statins and, and heart attack that we developed uh, a few years ago, we want to predict and want to tell the patients, okay, these are your chances of failing ATD, and this is the time that you might fail. Um, if you fail, you can continue with that, or you might switch, so patients can make a better decision in regards to ATD, radioactive iodine, or surgery. So with that, um, thank you very much. Dr. Brito, and, and thank you everyone for being here. It's a real pleasure to be with you all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Erkin, uh, Stella, Camilo, for the invitation. And I will go through briefly through the discussion. Uh, I have nothing to disclose, aside that I'm one of the authors of the presented article. Uh, I'll go briefly through the critical appraisal of the of the of the article. Uh, basically, uh, asking the first question is, uh, was the design of the story appropriate to answer the research question? And in this sense, it suggests a no. Uh, it suggests because the type of treatment modality used uh, is the correct, uh, but no for efficacy because an RCT design would be the, the best uh, type of study design to, to, to look for efficacy, right? However, I, I recognize probably as many as you that, uh, pr that doing an RCT with the treatment modalities, with the outcomes, the follow-up needed uh, is probably not feasible to perform in the short term. 
I also looked at the risk of bias at the study using the Newcastle Ottawa tool for cohort studies. This tool has uh, eight domains in a, every domain, and uh, to my to my knowledge the, or my assessment, uh, it was a low risk of bias. So that's a good thing I think about this study. Uh, of course, it has uh, limitations. I will not go very deep into this because uh, Dr. Brito already uh, went through this. Uh, pretty much, I think one of the most important limitations is uh, the granularity of the data that's lacking. So pretty much now we don't have any laboratory parameters. Uh, regarding efficacy, of course, there might be some confounding factors that can be or that probably are there and could have affected the efficacy of some of the um, treatment options. And uh, the other thing is that well, um, the external validity due to, that, due to that, and there are commercially insured patients and over 60 of percent of the population wide and from the U.S. Uh, might be different uh, from other uh, countries. However, I think uh, estimates and, and results are pretty much for, for the, from the papers uh, you and I know pretty much uh, go in the same dire direction. And SPIN, which is uh, basically uh, presenting results in a misleading uh, way, uh, to my uh, opinion, uh, I, I did not detect any. And finally, uh, none of the author reported a conflict of interest. So my overall impression of the of the article that Dr. Brito presented is that despite limitations, uh, estimates of the study to me is unreasonable, and I think generate at least moderate uh, to high confidence. So after going with this, uh, so why do we have a problem with engraved disease treatment? And I put problem in, with apostrophes because I don't really think we have a problem, but um, basically, what the ATA guidelines, as Dr. Brito mentioned uh, earlier, uh, basically tell us to go pretty much once we diagnose the, the disease to go any anywhere uh, of the three treatment modalities and this is a strong recommendation which basically tell us that all patients uh, to go through this so why this is kind of a problem because a strong recommendation means that uh, we should pretty much go anywhere uh, between the three treatment modalities and that is why i uh, probably uh, have to discuss with patients pros and cons and to to try to fit into what's the best for each patient. Of course, there are some ex exceptions, specific clinical scenarios, which you, you all know, in which a uh, particular specific uh, treatment modality is clear. But most of our patients, I think, will, will not uh, go into that in, into that category. So I'll briefly want to highlight three important things about the, the article that Dr. Brito uh, presented. And the first thing is to recognize that I think there's, if there's a clear shift in management, management of grave disease, at least in the US. Uh, this is a nice survey by Birch in 2011, published in JCM in 2012. It has a nice representation of, of treatment practices across the world. And what we can see is that clearly uh, radioactive iodine is in red and uh, antithyroid drugs is in blue, pretty much in most parts of the world, as you can see. Um, Antithyroid drugs are the preferred treatment option, as Dr. Brito also mentioned earlier. And it's uh, important, uh, this is very different, uh, at least in this survey, for, for the US, in which uh, radioactive iodine was the first choice at that time. Uh, so I think the first shift in paradigm that I think this study uh, uh, helped us know is that, at least in the US, the, it's clear that from around 2004, 2005, there's a, 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 a diversion in, in treatment modalities uh, at the, at from antithyroid drugs going, and going uh, being more frequently used and uh, radioactive iodine and more and more less being used, right? Uh, as Dr. Brito says, uh, thyroidectomy has been stable over years. So um, in the poll, I think uh, it's, it's also something uh, uh, most of you uh, answered that you you use some of the antithyroid drugs. So I think kind of uh, something to discuss as, uh, at the end of the presentation as why you think this is happening. Is it good? Not good? Maybe you can discuss at the end of the of the presentation. Uh, second thing I will I would like to highlight is um, our long term ITD is reasonable treatment for grave disease. Uh, and this is important because when you see the, the ATA, ATA guidelines 2016, basically when you choose metimazole or ATDs, it, it's clear that you, we should use it at least for 12, 18 months and then discontinue. And if failure, then try a, a radioactive iodine or a thyroidectomy. 
Uh, what I think is one of the more striking data that, uh, that Dr. Brito already highlighted in his presentation is that uh, for me is that it was that 26 percent of the patients remain on chronic uh, anti-thyroid um, anti drugs use. So this means uh, use, chronic use for more than two years, and and this and, and this I think it's um, kind of a, a game changer at least for for what, what we we knew at the at the, at the time. So a, a second potential shift in paradigm, and I think this is probably a good thing to, to discuss at the end, is when we talk about anti thyroid drugs, I think what we usually do with patients, what I did, what I usually did, uh, was tell them, well, you're gonna be in anti thyroid drugs for at least 12 to 18 months. The, the idea is to reach remission. If you tie, and then after you reach remission, uh, we can withdraw the drug and you can remain on it with this. Uh, however, uh, this second approach of going to long term means um, keeping the lowest dose on the thyroid drugs and then keep the patient uh, out thyroid without actually removing anti thyroid drugs. So, this uh, it means going from remission of anti thyroid drugs um, to out thyroidism with anti thyroid drugs. And, question is how effective are really anti thyroid drugs at reaching and maintaining out thyroidism? And we have some data for that. I will present just some of the, of the data. Uh, Lauber and colleagues in 2011 reported that over or around 90% of patients on long-term antithyroid drugs uh, with a minimum follow-up of 80 months were authorized at the moment. I have to say that uh, um, all of these patients were uh, had severe grades of tomopathy. Uh, there's also a systematic review published in 2017. Um, seven studies were included. This is the first plot and point estimates. As you can see, all of them favors or, uh, a remission rate of any long term use of anti thyroid drugs, basically with a point estimate of 0.57, so 57% remission rate. Uh, this is not uh, not a reducing, but remission rate. And an uh, important thing just here to highlight is that there's uh, heterogeneity in the results. As you can see, many of the of the estimates are not are in the same direction, but are not clearly uh, touching each other or similar. So that's a limitation of the study. Uh, this is a, a nice study I wanted to present because when you, we, we talk about the efficacy of radioactive iodine uh, and long-term anti thyroid drugs, um, these were uh, more than 400 patients with grave disease treated with anti thyroid drugs. Basically, uh, more than half of them relapsed uh, to grave disease after 12 to 24 months, which is the, the standard uh, that, the, that the guidelines dictate to do. And, uh, they were then uh, divided into uh, a low dose of anti thyroid drugs or uh, radioactive iodine and, and levotorexin replacement. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, at 12, 24, 36, 48, and 60 months, uh, pretty much uh, it's clear and, and that more patients were thyroid compared with, to radioactive iodine and replacement therapy in all of the timeframes that were evaluated. Um, Quality of life, I think uh, many times not, not looked in studies. Uh, what's the, the, the evidence we have regarding quality of, quality of life? This is um, a nice study published in 2019. And basically what they did, uh, this uh, Swedish cohort, they studied uh, over 90, 19, 900 patients that were treated with the three different modalities. And after seven to 10 years of treatment, they were looking at quality of life. Uh, this is uh, uh, the scale that they look for. It's the zero to a hundred scale, and as you go up in the scale, it means it is worse quality of life. And this was the the, the scales at the uh, at the, the moment we're having a worse uh, higher a higher score, which means worse quality of life for radioactive iodine. Um, and although this was uh, statistically significant, uh, I keep you and I, I make the question, is this really clinically significant, which I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure that it is. But well, there's, there's the data. Uh, treatment satisfaction, I think at the end it's also important. And in general, from the papers I'm sure you know, it's kind of inversely proportional to those adjustments. And there is some some data. Uh, not I think there's there's here there's an, a gap that needs to be filled with future studies that suggests that there's less frequent dose adjustments with long-term ATDs when compared to uh, LT4 replacement, so levotorexin replacement therapy that's used after iodine or total thyroidectomy. And this gets us to the part of cost, right? So. Uh, 
met both uh, levothyroxine and metimazole are kind of the similar cost, but by, you, we know that doing the lab test and going uh, to the doctor it has some cost, right? And if uh, we believe that uh, right, replacing with thyroid hormone this uh, more testing or this dose adjustment will be more than would mean you know, we will need to do more biochemical testing. And we know that uh, as, as we make more dose adjustments, the price goes up. Okay. So something to consider also. Um, an article that I think was uh, delivered to all the, the group was this article published in 2009. Uh, it's a cost effectiveness um, study comparing the three treatment modalities. And it, it concludes that uh, total thyroidectomy is the most cost effective. But the important thing here is up to a th threshold, which is around $19,000. Uh, I don't know, and because I, I I don't practice in the U.S., but I, I have seen and, and Dr. Brito's decision, and I and I saw that the cost it's around over 30 to 50 k, which which I which I don't know if it happens in some of your is it that's a real cost, but the important thing here is to to just acknowledge that it's more cost effective until a certain threshold. And of course, uh, an important thing to, to say here is that um, all the patients included here were those who failed after 18 months of ATDs. Uh, a concern, I think, for all of us is uh, more than efficacy, also to be safety. And in that sense, uh, there's a systematic review evaluating six studies that evaluate adverse events um, for uh, ATDs in the long term. And pretty much what we know, a major are less than 1% and, main, and minor can be uh, from anywhere to 2 to 36 percent, which in my opinion, 36 percent pretty, uh, I think is way too much, but uh, more common or most common uh, minor uh, adverse event was you know, uh, cutaneous um, lesions. Uh, I think at the end, we should also recognize that after total thyroidectomy or radioactive iodine, we'll need to give um, uh, levothyroxine replacement therapy. What happens aside those adjustments? is that from uh, earlier studies, we know that many patients will be over and under replaced. And, and with each, it's all, all with, with the cons on, on each side, right? Uh, probably for more elderly, higher incidence of stroke and AFib, a lot of our grape disease patients are not that, not, not, not that elderly, so maybe not that, not, not, not that much of a problem for many of them. But however, many will go in with a low TSH, and many are under replaced and what's the effect on quality of light, weight, uh, some questions that remain. But at the same time, if we decide to go on long-term ATDs, some of the things that we really don't know is um, we can induce hypothyroidism. And then some, pap some papers I won't present here for, for time concerns, but uh, it seems to be low uh, from around, for the, from those who continue long-term from around five to 10%. Uh, and if we go to a hypothyroidism, then we need to do a block replacement therapy. And if we do both, then the cost will increase, probably the burden of treatment increase, and then is it worth right? I think it's some, some of the questions that need to be answered. So at the end with this, I think we all see grave disease patients in a daily basis, and we still have to make decisions. So how to make the best decision for each patient? And here is the last point that I wanted to, to highlight is that we need, I think, as a patient-centered strategy so as sort of chair decision making in grave disease. And the guidelines uh, pretty much tells us that this is what we should have to do in, in pay with patients. And pretty much I think you probably are all familiar with the chair decision making approach, which is a patient-centered approach in which um, the patients and clinicians um, uh, take into consideration different treatment options, the pros and the cons, and the clinician is seen as, as the expert in the evidence, but the patient is also seen as the expert in how the illness is filled, in how the medications are taken, in how the adverse events of the medications are taken, and more importantly, how the grave disease illness also fits with other comorbidities that the patient might have, and more importantly, also with his family, social, and economic issues. And at the end, I have to talk about the, the pros and cons of the different options. And here is where, where I think uh, JP's uh, decision aid and uh, that they that the team developed uh, it's it's important 
or helps a lot for this conversation. So uh, in the tradition making process, uh, I think the first step is acknowledge we have uncertainty. I think uh, we probably all agree that there's not a clear best choice for everyone. And after doing that, uh, it's supposedly what have we have to do is um, the clinician to chose the patient different options. And, and, and I think uh, you have not used um, the decision aid that Dr. Brio presented. I think it's fantastic just to, to see uh, um, graphically very nice the, the options. And what I think is a, probably a game changer here and is what was Dr. Brito was talking at the end is that uh, we are usually uh, used to tell patients that you're going to go to anti anti drugs for 12 to 18 months and then stop. But after the evidence that we're seeing, uh, we might think now that uh, long-term anti drugs, if they fail to remission after 12 to 18 months, might be a safe and effective option. And if the patient has failed and the important things for them, for him or her, are not having permanent hypothyroidism and avoiding surgery, then long term, and then when they did make the deliberation, perhaps long term will be a, a good option for that patient, right? At the end, I think the best approach is that we can individualize treatment for each patient and try to, to, to get what, the better treatment for, for that particular patient. Uh, we must recall, I know many of the patients with grave disease are young and they don't have a lot of comorbidities, but we also face some patients that they don't, they have other comorbidities. So for many patients, it's not just the thyroid. They might well, uh, they might as well have diabetes, they might as well have high blood pressure, uh, this epidemia, uh, they might be obese, as many of our patients, uh, unfortunately. They will have to follow nutrition therapy. Many of them will be depressed. And why not one of every four patients with diabetes have um, painful diabetic neuropathy? And it's difficult, right? Because at the end, we just we have to fit the treatment plan, not only in grave disease, but take into consideration, I think, the, the whole picture, the whole comorbidities of the patients. And more important also, there are family, social, and economic issues that also play a role in, in it's very important. So the, the future, uh, and, and I don't think it's Dr. Brito agree with me, I, 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 I did this and probably not correct, but Dr. Brito, I'm sorry. So probably talk about conventional in long term, right? Uh, I think that that might be a, a game changer what I, for what I see from the study. And of, of course, I think there are some questions that remain and that should be answered. So regarding long-term, so what are the, the real impact on, on long-term outcomes, right? So which follow-up strategies are needed and how to, should we follow these patients? And what's the burden, the real burden of treatment of continuing anti drugs for five, 10 years or more and the cost related? And with this, I end my presentation. Here is the case presentation. Thank you, uh, Juan and Renee. We're going to go ahead and uh, just let people finish up the poll. We have a significant number of questions that um, as uh, as we approach the nine o'clock hour, I'd like to see if we can't get to as many of these as possible. So as soon as the poll results are posted um, and we see uh, if we have had an impact here on people's perceptions on of treatment, um, uh, I think this will close momentarily. Okay, if we could just uh, show the results of the um, initial and the final poll, that would be great. Um, but I do want to get to these questions and maybe if we could limit um, the answers uh, to really brief answers, um, that would be great. So it does look like, I think this was the upfront um, and the final, it looks like we did have um, a change in um, some decision making here and people's perceptions. So that's great um, uh, that we've accomplished our goal of trying to influence outcomes here um, and approaches. So one of the first questions is um, posted by Dr. Davies and it's related to um, how uh, limited it is it to analyze Graves outcomes without um, having data on TSH receptor antibody levels. Um, this is directed at one. Yes, and, and this is a very good question. Uh, so I think every everything 
So it matters depending on the goals of the study. So the goal of the study was not to predict who fails, was to characterize who fails. So the, in other words, we is a very descriptive nature of just a picture of who is failing a United, in the United States when they get treated with this medicine. The goal of the study was not to predict who is going to fail based on baseline characteristics. So clearly, if you want to predict who fails, trap or only antibody markers need to be considered there. Actually, we we are conducted with a, our group of researchers, um, a multidiscipline, a multi-center co prospective data collection of thousand patients with rare disease to answer that specific question of what is the role of trap with other uh, markers uh, to predict who responds to treatment because this is not a this design was not meant to respond to that question. Great, uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, Dr. Horowitz has raised the question of what was um, what criteria were used um, for a hard stop on a ATDs. Um, if you could address that, and then um, okay, let me let me stop there. Uh, Juan, can you just answer that question? So, any patient that was taking uh, methimazole or, or PTU and uh, they stopped the medicine, and in 90 days after that, they did not feel medicines like those ones or radioactive iodine or surgery, they were considered that they stopped treatment. Um, and the reason why the 90 days is because we noticed that some practices, they might actually not send a new field, a new prescription to the pharmacy, but they might ask the patients to, to just cut the pills in half. So we needed to do 90 days after the last field of methimazole to make sure that we account for that uh, kind of a different dosing. And so anything, any patient that who were taking methimazole did not stop filling the methimazole. We gave it 90 days as a period of time, if those 90 days they don't feel another methimazole, we consider a stop of the, of the therapy. Great. And um, the uh, um, Dr. Horowitz has asked what you tell patients about radioactive iodine treatment and eye disease. So, they, of course, there is a consistent evidence that radioactive iodine treatment might increase the risk of Graves orbitopathy. Um, so, that risk is in about uh, eight to 10%, depending on different studies. So that risk is more uh, remarkable in those patients that have already some baseline Graves orbitopathy. Uh, patients who do not or do not have Graves orbitopathy, I usually present the option that is unlikely to happen, but compared to the other alternatives, there is an increased risk that they might have worsening or just the uh, some presence of some signs of grace or retopathy. So in the decision, and maybe I didn't show that, but in the decision, and we actually mentioned that radioactive iodine uh, does have an increased risk of grace or retopathy, but we also present as, um, as something that needs to be considered depending on where you're at at the moment of treatment. And that is something that might happen within two years of therapy. So uh, it is something that I do mention the patients a lot, although I don't think that is being weighted for the patients as a ways that we think. Patients actually weighted more. They consider the levothyroxine therapy as the main issue uh, in the decision-making process. Uh, for patients who don't have grave disease, it's very difficult for them to imagine what uh, might be grave orbitopathy. But the idea of taking levothyroxine has probably more implications in decision-making that rather than the other side effects. Great. Um, so I'm, I'd like to uh, um, put forth a comment from Mac Harrell, um, and it's uh, the following. Um, his interpretation of your data is that if you're able to get 12 months of ATD therapy under your belt, the failure rate drops to 25%, but realize that this is a very select group that has smaller glands and likely um, lower TSI. Failure prior to one year is quite common, and these patients would never make it into your one year of therapy group, and this definitely um, inflates your ATD success rate in the one year group. So I would change your summary statement to the following. If the patient is able to tolerate and show efficacy from ATD treatment over one year, there is a subsequent 25% failure rate. How do you feel about that, Juan? No, I think that is, is a, a very good um, 
perspective of the results. So I think the, the argument is to some extent, we, we will not know if those patients were the ones who were able to, to, to keep up with the medicine and, and they were just waiting for the one year mark. So I think that that comment is, is actually right on that these are patients that if they are able to tolerate one year of therapy, the chances of having remission drops. And that kind of makes sense because it's the, it's the pattern of our immunity that decreases over time. So the longer you keep um, supporting the patients without signs of symptoms of rare disease, the autoimmunity will eventually decrease and maybe the remission uh, rate is actually lower. So I, I do agree with that perspective. I think that the data can also be presented like that. The results could be presented like this, yes. Great. So Dr. Coben has um, raised a question regarding surgical complications that are quoted, and you alluded to that. Um, but you had stated that your assumption is that the hypoparathyroidism is probably an inflated number and um, doesn't reflect transient hypoparathyroidism, but offer um, no actual proof of that. And she comments that um, if this was a real number, um, then that certainly would influence um, uh, would would influence patient decision making and also um, uh, questions regarding surgical competence and volume of surgery, et cetera. No, that is a very important comment. I think the uh, yes, I'm making an assumption there that this is a temporary hypoparas, which is an assumption because I don't have the evidence to support that. Um, a, I think from the big thing about this study is that we are including uh, the majority of people who were treated surgically without selecting the ones who were treated in um, institutions with uh, high experienced surgeons. And that is a significant selection bias in, the, in, in published uh, papers that the rates of complication is lower and because there are the institutions that are publishing that data. But it is possible, and that's literature from type of cancer, that the complication rates that are usually in the literature are really underrepresented, and we are more likely dealing with surgeons who are not type of surgeons or next surgeons doing many of these surgeries and having the rates of complications much higher. So perhaps this actually represents what's going on, with the caveat that we cannot tell for this data set whether or not that was um, temporary or chronic. Okay, terrific. Um, and also, um, Dr. Rao has raised the question as to what the indications for surgery were in the 6% of, um, of your cohort who uh, went on to surgery. So it, that, the, that granularity of data we don't have. Um, as mentioned previously, it could be patient's preferences or could be the fact that the glands were big or they were nodules. So we don't have the granularity of that data from the cohort that we have previously of the uh, 600 patients at Mayo Clinic. Surgery was mostly a technical decision when there was a large goiter nodularity and very few patients actually opted for surgery as a patient preferences uh, issue. It was mostly about a technical aspect that this is a big gland, big gland this is causing obstruction symptoms, this is a nodular disease, maybe it's a small area of cancer, we better deal with it surgically. So surgery became more a technical uh, decision point rather than something that patients actually were choosing. And we did not see a significant change with the use of the decision aid. Uh, surgery continues to be um, one of the most uh, uncommon choices for patients. Terrific. I'm gonna, um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna um, put one more comment out there for your review, and this is from Dr. Coben. Um, she, come, she states that she comes from an institution with a very long history of the use of um, RAI, uh, but more recent gradual shift to long-term ATD uh, therapy um, as reflected in your survey. Even so, we still see lots of impact of opinion of individual doctors, which affects how statistics are presented to patients for decision-making. Um, physicians more aware of concerns for ophthalmopathy, possible secondary cancers after I-131, also more um, physician comfort with long-term use of ATDs. I also think that some, in some populations, there is some significant effect of internet um, info information with dissatisfied patients on T4 replacement. I don't Not yet. 
I, I agree with I, I agree with all of that. I think the, the question describes many of the aspects of, of the issues we should issue making in the, in the sense that clinicians sometimes feel that they know the best treatment for everybody, um, which is a big assumption. But they will also know the limitations from the other, day, other end. Patients have misconceptions about that. So that's where that's where the encounter, the conversation should try to get to the point that um, we should choose something that works for you uh, based on your values, preferences, and context. But the, it's a challenge. And that's why we're trying to develop the tool because you know. If you if you get to ask one clinician, one clinician will say, no, this is radioactive iron, the other clinician will say surgery, and the other clinician will say ITV. And you ask the patients and they can have a different opinion than the clinician. So the alignment of those is a challenge. And but I, I do agree, those are very important issues in the in the decision making process. Terrific. Well, we are right at the uh, uh, nine o'clock hour, and um I, I think we could go on for quite some time here. I want to thank both Juan and Renee for uh, really terrific presentations. Um, I personally learned a lot this morning, and it was really a pleasure to have both of you. Um, uh, again, I encourage individuals to um, uh, write in their comments, questions, concerns regarding the program, and I hope that uh, and everyone has a great weekend. Stay safe, and hopefully we will uh, see you back in two weeks. Next week uh, is a holiday, so we won't be having a, um, a, a journal club, and um, we'll see you back in two weeks. All the best. Take care. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Pleasure. Back.